true, I, I am a professor of philosophy at the University of Copenhagen. My name is Vincent Hendricks. Thank you all for having me here today. See, um, now I understand that, that I might not look like a philosophy professor, and some of you might have thought, who invited a baseball player or a bouncer or a convict in combat fatigues? And I'll return to that in a second. I'll take you back to attention for a second. I'll take you back to what it is we do and why it is important. See, one of my sons not too long ago, oops, right there. So one of my sons told, asked me in 2008, he asked me, I was winning a big award, and he asked me, listen, I've got to ask you a question, Pop. What is, it, what, 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 what is it really that you do? Which in and by itself, of course, is a pretty good question. But the follow-up is even better. He goes, and why is it important? And that's the kind of question I've been trying to answer ever since. Why is it important what we do? And before I get to exactly why it's important, what it is that we do, and what it is that you do in the restaurant business besides serving good food and omelets, let's go back for a while. Actually, many of you today or yesterday went through the Copenhagen airport. I've been there too. And for years, I was always stopped in the airport. And they were looking through my luggage and the customs, and they couldn't find no dope and no guns. And then the end of it, they would go, so what it is it really that you do? And I would tell them, well, look, I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Copenhagen. And the custom officers would go, mm-hmm. <laughs> sure you are. And if you're a professor of philosophy, that would make me Napoleon Bonaparte. And for years, that really bothered me, until I realized that what seems to be our greatest downfall might actually be our greatest asset. The interesting thing is not to give people what they expect. The ambitious thing is to give them what they expect, and then a little of what they don't expect. And another thing about Copenhagen Airport, I don't know if you know this, but for years, the primary reason for private jets to land in Copenhagen Airport was NOMA. Now, that should tell you one thing. What we operate on on a daily basis is our narratives, okay? Because narratives are what we use to navigate in this world. And if, I get to, and if I get the piece of information that the primary reason why people get to Copenhagen is to visit Noma in private jets, my narrative will immediately be, it's for the posh, it's for the preppy, it's for the elite. It is excluding rather than including and that I will have nothing of. But narratives don't have to be true to catch attention. They could be very wrong, and it is wrong, that no more is just for the prep and the posh, but narratives are what we use to navigate in this world, so we have to worry about not what we think of ourselves, but what others think about us. And if you look at the restaurant business from that perspective, things might change a little bit. So if you look at what is valuable besides children, then in the information age, what is valuable is not money, it's not immediately what you could talk about as, there's something wrong with my slides. Okay. What is not immediately valuable in the information age is not money or oil or microchips and whatnot. Back in 1971, and I was one year old at that time, Herbert Simon, who was Nobel Prize laureate in economics said, prophetically about the information age to come, he said, in an information-rich world, we are going to find a scarcity of something else. A scarcity of whatever it is that information consumes. But what, inf but in what information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. And that will tell you that the number one asset in the information age is really attention. And attention is something that is being allocated or caught based on information and the narratives that goes along with these things. So attention is the primary asset. That's what everybody is fighting for. Because, look, if it was only about the money, what are you doing in the restaurant business? If I was only about making money, I would be making these guys. Landmines, they're great. 
They stack easily. They can transport all over the world at relatively low cost. And it's great about the customers because they don't ever complain. They're either dead or they don't care. And if, if it was all about the money, I would top it up with something else. You realize that 10% of all bandwidth online is allocated to one and one topic only. Which topic? Porn. Porn takes 10% of all traffic online. So I would combine landmines with porn. <laughs> because in comparison, political debate and dispute online only reserves 0.01% of all traffic. And all due respect for the restaurant business, you're not going to get 10% immediately. I tell you that much for sure. But you realize, of course, that good business is not the same as right business. So how do we get to right business? What is right business? What is right business when you are in the restaurant business? I certainly appreciate a good meal, but it can't carry on forever. So if you don't have ambition that goes beyond cooking good food, I'll take a hot dog stand if I'm really hungry and I can't afford no more on a daily basis, I'm out. So what is it that we do and why is it important in the restaurant business? Well, let's look at it and see what's there. But before we get to that, there is a certain similarity between landmines and some food you can get. Look at the colors, at least. So where to go to for a good idea of what it is we do and why it is important? Well, I urge you to look at, say, World Economic Forum 10 challenges to the world. Look at them. Food security, inclusive growth, employment, climate change, global finance, the internet, gender equality, global trade, long-term investment, and healthcare. And that's by the World Economic Forum. And of course, the UN has 17 goals that we have to fulfill. None of those goals can be satisfied or met. If we do it on an individual basis, we have to do it collectively. So even the restaurant business, if you want to make more than money, you have to feed into an agenda that is bigger than yourselves. You gotta be ambitious on a goal that goes beyond serving good food and having a good food experience. And you can eat the cake and have it, there are many ways in which you can feed into that. Look at this, food security, that goes for you. I could come to think of uh, gender equality. I think you might have an issue there. And since you have such a bullhorn to the world, since jets are landing in the Copenhagen airport to get to Noma, that means that there's something called food tourism. And it's growing. So your bullhorn is growing accordingly. And since the bullhorn is growing accordingly, you have a civil responsibility to do more than just serve food. You have to feed into an agenda that's important to this world. Because I'll tell you one thing. I have children, and I cannot bear to be the first generation in humankind to leave a world which is worse off than the one I received from my parents. And you might say, oh, Vincent, that's dystopia. And I'm saying to you, look, we got Donald Trump. And if you're not careful, we're going to get Kanye West for president and Kim Kardashian for Secretary of State. And then they have to worry about these issues. Run for cover. So what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of agendas you can actually feed into while you're serving the good food. And the interesting thing about that is, even if it sounds pretty boring and unsexy, you can make it accordingly. So take two things that might sound extremely boring. Water slides are fun the first couple of times, and then you get cold and you want to get out of the water. So that's not too interesting. Um, and also, the ballistic trajectory of projectiles. Unless you're a physicist, you're going to find that very uninteresting. But of course, you can combine them in ways where you go, that one I hadn't seen before, and that is sort of interesting. So this, this video here has a viral life online, and I can sort of understand why. Look at this. That is pretty funny. <laughs> and the good thing about a laugh is it's a way into people's consciousness. And you know what? That's the same with attention. Attention is a way into our consciousness. So give people a laugh while you're saying something important is probably the best way to get them to get a new idea. 
I found this quote by James Dean. There's always this idea that you should show them, don't tell. But he's actually a little more nuanced to that. He says, reality doesn't have any preconceived ideas. It's sort of, as Robert De Niro says in Casino, it is what it is. You've got to learn how to smoke the cigarette, not act smoking the cigarette. You need to drink the drink, not act drinking the drink. You've got to do things, not show them. And the reason why he probably put him in that order is, before you can show, you have to do. And doing is the number one vehicle for change. So when I heard the introduction that was given here is, we are here to celebrate each other. Good. I think you deserve it. But I think you also have to celebrate something else. What you do have to celebrate is also the fact that you have been working so hard and you are spending so much of your prime effort into the food and into getting people a good experience with food. Now, why, also, why don't you also take the derivative of that in making a change? So let me give you an example. I don't particularly care about Tommy Hilfiger's suits. I think they're too narrow. I like the Godfather type better. And I don't particularly care about Christian Jaws number five, probably because my wife doesn't use it. So I'd buy neither. However, if it was such that after making perfume and, on the other hand, suits for men, if Tommy Hilfiger and Christian Dior joined hand and said, besides making these two products so we at least get people what they expect, let's do, thing, do something which they do not expect. Let's see if we can be part of creating peace in the Middle East. I'll buy both, and twice on Sunday. Two suits and two bottles of perfume every Sunday, because that is something that I like to buy into. And I think it's fair to say that the next generation, they are not going to be true to you just because they went there once. If you change your profile, they're not going to come again. And so what I'm saying with that is the following, namely, they are buying identity too. They're not only stupid consumers like me. They buy identity while they're at it. They buy group belonging. They buy ideology in the way they use the products. And we have to figure in and figure out the way in which what sort of ideas, what sort of ideology the next generation wants to push. And while we are at it, we have to help them get there because if we were the ones who were going to leave a world worse off than the ones we got from our parents, just look at World Economic Forum's 10 challenges, and you'll see we do have an issue here. And there are many issues you can feed into. Um, I know, I know, I know I've heard that there is an issue in the restaurant business about the hashtag Me Too. It doesn't take much to create a problem or be part of it, but it sure as hell takes a long time to get out of it and to change it. Now, since the gender inequality in the restaurant business is so pronounced as it is, then one obvious way to actually feed into a grander agenda would be to say, look, we are going to do something proactively about leveling out the differences between the agendas. And while we are doing that, we are also going to get a different kind of alignment, an alignment to the effect that if the gender equality was more balanced, then probably there would be less of this. Probably that would be less than me too, by the shared dynamics of the way things would work in the kitchen. So do me a favor, think about that's just one. And if you decide to make your kitchen such that it seems as if that it seems as if that you are part of the military barracks instead, it's not gonna be an incentive to get women to work there. It's not gonna happen. So what that entails is that if you want to make the change, you have to go all the way. And going all the way also means that you can't slip. But then again, once you don't slip, you are part of an agenda that's much bigger than yourself, and then you are beyond the landmines and the porn. And so I urge you to think about this, namely, whenever you walk into the kitchen, ask yourself, what is it that I do? And that you can answer. And you can answer it at length because it takes you half an hour to do an omelet. <laughs> so there is no such thing as you don't knowing that part. I also know what I do as a teacher at the University of Copenhagen 
But sometimes I forget what the greater picture is. I'm worried about whether they know the existential quantifier or the universal quantifier, or the disjunction rule for elimination, whatnot. But sometimes I tend to forget, what, what am I doing? What I'm really doing is trying to be a little bit of a piece in a big mosaic that has to go to the end of getting the next generation prepped to take over. Everything from the State Department to who works at the supermarket. Now, once I think about it from that perspective, it makes it particularly more meaningful than it was before. And since you have a bullhorn that is so much bigger than mine, I urge you when you walk into your kitchen going, we're going to have full plates tonight, every single table is going to be taken. What am I serving besides serving them a good food experience? And so my message to you tonight is humbly, that if you have a bullhorn this size, you have to serve more than a good food experience. You have to serve the world. You are civil actors now if you have this kind of bullhorn to the world. Now, of course, as I said before, that's a big responsibility and tough. That's just the way of the world. And if you don't start making a change there, we are going to end in a zero-sum game where one wins and one loses, or we are going to end in the prisoner's dilemma, which is going to be suboptimal for everybody. So we have to pool our wealth, we have to pool our strengths between academics in one end and food in the other, politicians, scientists, and whatnot. And I know you even have food laboratories. So you are already in the game. And my urge is just take this responsibility with you to the kitchen, make a difference to this world in such a way that we actually have a chance of getting this place to be a better place to be, and then we know exactly what it is that we do and why it is important. I think I have to follow Forrest Gump from that and saying that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. <laughs>